Welcome to Moments with Mary Ann. This is your host, Mary Ann Pastana. And we're here today with special guest, David Pruitt, who's here to share with us his new memoir, Relative Distance. So can an upbringing of challenges, abuse, and violence allow room for faith and determination to grow? We'll be exploring just these questions with David Pruitt today. David is a first-generation college graduate from UNC Greensboro and previously served on the advisory board for their Bryan School of Business. A licensed CPA and member of the AICPA and NCACPA, David started his career in an entry-level accounting position before advancing to first CFO, then CEO of Performance Bike which for a time was the largest cycling retailer in the United States. So let's welcome to the show, David Pruitt. Uh, well, thanks, Marianne. I'm, uh, I'm excited to be here. What an honor it is to have you here and to talk about your memoir. Why did you decide now was the right time to write this? I worked uh, for 35 years in corporate America. I was raising my two sons and trying to be a good husband, and uh, that came to an end Uh you know, a few years back. And, uh, you know, when you have a time of change, like your career ending, you get in sort of a reflection mode. And, um, you know, I, I think at some point, all of us are amazed, perhaps a little bit at our life journey and where we've gotten to versus where we started. And I certainly had that feeling for myself. And uh, my career, which fortunately for me, was a successful one. Uh, you know, I struggled throughout, even raising to my kids with some of the things that happened to me when I was young. I uh, began reflecting on that and just writing a little bit about it. I'm not sure I ever thought it would become a book, but then I, as I had retired, I found my brother who had been homeless uh, for many years. Uh, I had lost him for 27 years and I found him when I retired. And so I went to see him. We had an emotional reunion and uh, you know, I learned his story. And I also, it became clear how much he was affected by the things, uh, you know, the challenges of our youth. And so when I understood the impact on him and on myself, and then I did research uh, and and, and understand how pervasive this is uh, in American society, then I just felt, you know, I could lend my voice uh, in the form of a book, tell my story, and also with a particular focus on sort of moving beyond a dysfunctional upbringing that might be helpful uh, to some folks. So Uh, Yeah, it's really crazy. There's 25 to 30 million adults in America today that have some form of abuse or neglect uh, that occurred in their youth that they carry around with them. And they, they, like me, remain silent about it. And, uh, you know, I just decided I was at a place in my life where I could do it. I wanted to do it well. And I took a couple of years to write it. And I'm, I'm proud of the finished product. Well, I can see why it's so just beautifully written and put together. Uh, it really immerses the reader into what it was like for for our listeners. Why don't you share a little bit about what it was like growing up? Sure. Uh, so uh, I grew up in the blue collar South, uh, specifically Greensboro, North Carolina. Uh, I was raised on the eastern side of the city, which I think it's fair to say was the less affluent side of the city. But uh, I had two older siblings, uh, just a couple of years older than me. And uh, my father was a was a factory guy, worked in a factory. And my mom who had studied to be a nurse, she she became mentally ill and she was schizophrenic. And she was basically out of our lives by the time I was 10 years old. My father, who had a great sense of responsibility and was a hardworking guy, unfortunately, I think he had some mental issues and he, uh, he was severely physically and verbally abusive to myself and my siblings. And my mom was gone by the time I was 10. By the time I was 18, both of my brothers were homeless on the streets of Greensboro. And uh, I nearly joined them. I had a a big blowout with my father and he uh, put me out. And uh, but fortunately, I played some sports and someone, uh, a mother of one of the players that I played with, she took me in for a little while and I wound up going to college. I became a first generation college graduate, uh, got my CPA license, corporate America for 35 years. 20 of those years, I was either CFO or CEO of a company and we grew a business from 30 million to 250 million dollars and uh you know it was more successful than I could imagine but all my life I struggled with with the things as I mentioned earlier and uh, that's probably more of my background than you wanted to know but 
the interesting thing, while I was working through corporate America, my brother, who his, I tell his story in the book, uh, he was homeless with a backpack on his back, traveling across America, sleeping under overpasses, jumping freight trains, and really just trying to figure out his life and his place in the world as I, as I was doing myself. And that's really what the book is about, that journey to finding your sense of purpose, no matter uh, your difficult circumstances. Well, I, I know also you touch on just how here you are, two brothers going through, I believe, similar experiences in many ways. And for one brother to end up homeless, the other one a CEO. I mean, where where did that diverge? I mean, where did that kind of happen for you? You know, that's one of the reasons I I wrote the book to begin with, because I was so mystified by why these different outcomes had occurred. And first, you know, I'm very proud of both of my brothers. They're doing well today. Uh, and there was a very thin line between the trajectory of my life and their lives. And for one of a decision here or there, it could have gone very differently. But, you know, some of the factors that I that was in my head as I wrote the book and, and did some research is that, you know, we're all products of two parents. We get a, a, a good, bad mixture of a blended gene pool. Right. So there's a you know, there's a mixture component to each sibling. And so that's certainly uh, some of it, I, I, I suppose. And for me, in my particular situation, birth order was was very important to me. I was the youngest of three sons. I saw the struggles that my brothers were having. I was having a lot of struggles, too. I barely finished high school. But, uh, you know, seeing the challenges that they were faced with and, and, you know, it really jolted me at the right time in my life. Uh, so just birth order served me well because I saw the struggles and it made me fearful of that and go a different path. Yeah, there's individual uh, circumstances and decisions. You know, we had the same environment in the home, but we had different environments and friends that we surrounded ourselves outside the home. And, you know, I, 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 there's a real aspect of faith in my book. And so I often wondered about the role of divine intervention. <laughs> and I don't I'm not pretentious enough to believe that I was favored in any way, believe me. But, uh, you know, all of these things, I think, are, um, you know, weigh in the direction of a life. And, um, yeah, but it, what certainly weighs on the direction of your life is, is your upbringing. Uh, and that, that is without question. You can overcome it, but that, that is a very challenging part of who you, who you become as an adult is, uh, is deeply impacted by how you were raised as a child. I think we all understand that. Well, I know some people would rather say they're raised by wolves than the parents they have sometimes, you know, <laughs> it'd make a little bit more sense, right? <laughs> but I, and you know, all joking aside, I mean, I can understand, my goodness, like your brother, Danny, he really went through, um, you know, trial by fire with everything. And it, usually you hear about that with the older siblings because they're breaking the parents in for what's going to happen next. <laughs> Well, you know, it, it trial by fire is an interesting uh, way to put. You know, I'm really so proud of him. I mean, how many people can can be homeless? You know, not have a real roof over their head and stability in their lives for over 20 years, and uh, survive and ultimately thrive. I mean, he he married a wonderful woman. He's independent, taking care of himself now. So he he came a long way. But his story uh, was just amazing to me. You know, and I. I think I mentioned a little bit of the aspect of faith. Faith played a role in both of our journeys. I think uh, for him, faith manifested itself in the form of a Bible that he had in his backpack uh, that he carried with him all the time. And when I found him after 27 years, it was pretty amazing, Marianne. He can quote chapter and verse, which is not something that I can do. But uh, so his faith carried him through a lot of tough times. For me, faith manifested itself in the form of prayer. And I show some of that in the book with some of the, I actually show some, you know, recall some of the prayers that I had at these very, very difficult or challenging moments in my life and prayer, you know, when you're an abused child uh, and you're searching for hope, right. Then prayer, you know, having prayer and some sort of faith and there's a power that can help you get beyond your current circumstances. Prayer was so sustaining for me, so comforting to me. And it also played a role in my our brother's life. But again, I'm, I'm so proud of both of my brothers. They're in a great place now. Uh, we just had a tough journey that started in a hard place. Well, I, I think they both have done phenomenal, you know, and the book is written so well going over, it, you know, just the experiences that you all had. 
I was so taken aback by the stats that are there for abused children. And I'd love for you to share some of those with us. Yeah, so there's, uh, in America today, there's a report of child abuse every 10 seconds made to a child protection agency. Over 4.3 million children each year are reported to a child protection agency because there's, you know, it's questionable how they're being raised. Uh, two thirds of people that are in treatment for drug abuse in this country report being abused, report being neglected or abused as children. And uh, what the most startling statistic that I found in my research was was the following. Uh, so, thirty six percent of women who are in prison were abused as children. Fourteen percent of men. And uh, my research indicates that you can cut those percentages in half and apply that to the adult male and female population in the United States. And that leaves you with that 25 to 30 million people that have some element of this in their lives. And my book is about getting beyond it. I mean, I don't pull any punches about what happened. I try to be as real. And, uh, and yeah, my job is put the reader in the good moments and the bad moments. But I've had so many uh, texts, emails, uh, just contact with people who had these things in their lives. And they're just so appreciative of someone putting the story out there to raise awareness. And yeah, Marianne, I will say this, and I'm uh, you know, I'm saying it because I'm passionate about my cause. You know, I didn't I didn't write this book as an income producing activity for me. Any proceeds are going to go to organizations like uh, Prevent Child Abuse America because I'm so passionate about it. it. I mean, what is more disturbing, more sad, more frustrating than to have a potential of an innocent child be stolen from them by the way they were raised. I mean, that I can't think of anything worse in, uh, in life you, because you're just born into these circumstances and you have no control, but there is a way beyond it. And uh, again, I, in the epilogue of my book, I spent a lot of, I really laid out kind of the five most important things for me for moving beyond it. But those are some of the numbers. Those are a lot of numbers. I hope it's not too many. No, that's just perfect to to go over that. And and just also to remind our listeners, I mean, when we talk about the 70s, things were totally different then. There wasn't a whole lot of, if, I mean, if you, uh, if you spanked your child, that was keeping them in line. That wasn't child abuse, you know, so we've made so much progress since then. That's true. But, uh, you know, one of the a final statistic I'll give you is that 30% of, uh, Adults who were abused as children abused their children. It's sort of the carry forward legacy of it. And even though norms and expectations have changed today, I mean, I just gave you the numbers. There's still over 4 million children that are being reported to child protection agencies each year. So it, it, it believe me, it's, it's, it's still happening. It's amazing that it is happening in 2022, but it still is happening. And, uh, Again, you know, I do, I do want the reader to understand or your listener who, who may have an interest in, in the book that, uh, you know, I get I, I, I get down to it in terms of what happened. But I spend a lot of time in talking about moving beyond it, which to me is the most important thing, because it's, since it's still happening, there's people that still have to manage it in their lives and still have to uh, be productive and human beings and meet their full potential. And I, yeah, I wanted to at least give all the insights that I had in my life. Uh, to uh, to uh, to someone who might need it. So what are some of the things, and we're not going to go over all of them, but maybe like one or two ways that people can move beyond that? Because uh, as you're saying, I mean, the stats are so high. So many people in the U.S. have either been a victim or have suffered from this. Well, a couple of things. I, I'll give you one thing as if, if there's someone out there who might be listening that's a relatively young person in 20s or 30s that that went through some uh, some difficult things and they're trying to get their feet up under them. I'll give you one thing there. And I'd like to give one other thing for an adult who was abused as a child, maybe how they can manage it in their life. So the first thing is, um, you know, when you're a young person, say you're just coming out of a difficult, dysfunctional uh, family upbringing, you're trying to find, you get your feet up under you. One of the best things that I found, you, you can't find your role model in the four walls of your house. Obviously, you've got some dysfunction going on. If you have siblings, they may be going through it too. But there are wonderful role models in the world outside of your home that you can emulate. You can, they can have character and integrity that you admire. 
uh, an intellect that you respect, a good heart that warms your heart. But you, those people are out there. You know, find those people. There's a way to behave that is not the behavior that's in your home that can be invaluable to you and, to, and you know, ultimately defining the type of person you're going to be. So that's one thing for someone just kind of coming up out of it. One thing I'd, I'd say to if there's 25 to 30 million adults that have an element of this in their lives today, one of the things that I have found so helpful to me in, um, in, in kind of managing myself and the memories is that you have to actively work to lose yourself in the moments of your life instead of the thoughts in your head. What I'm saying is be present in your life. You know, an adult who was abused as a child, you don't gain a lot of uh, personal benefit by a lot of negative self-reflection. So, you know, you got the voices in your head that you might recall. You've got the memories that are there. But, you know, you've got such a great life in front of you. If you have family, if you have children, if your daughter's in a school play, you know, be there cheering her on. If you're watching the Carolina Tar Heels play basketball with your friends, be there in your life. And there's things you can do in terms of meditation techniques, breathing techniques, but actively be self-aware. Be self-aware about being present. When you catch yourself in those moments of self-reflection, put yourself back in your life because there's so many wonderful things that are available to you. So those, that's one thing that I, I really work at is just being present um, to manage myself. Have you and your brothers gotten to a place of forgiveness for your parents? Yeah, Marianne, that's that's a that's a good question. It's uh, when we, yeah. You know, so I found my one brother that was missing for 27 years. We, uh, yeah. Look, I loved my father. It, it was a it was a complicated relationship. My mother was unable uh, unable to care for us. We could have wound up in an orphanage. That didn't happen. I took care of my father uh, until he passed away, and I was I was happy doing that. You know, uh, there was never an apology that was exchanged between the two of us. Uh, I, you know, I didn't need it by the time that uh, yeah, I'd moved far enough along in my life that I knew I was fine. Uh, so I don't hold a grudge against my father uh, and, and my mother. It, it, we never established a relationship. It's not there. But one thing that is interesting is that my two brothers, when, when we were together and talking about it, one of my brothers was would say, well, you know, like my grandfather, who was a farmer, a sharecropper, uh, he he beat him, my father, pretty brutally. And so, again, my father passed it on. So my one of my brothers was saying that, um, you know, well, it happened to him, so he did it to us, and he didn't know any better, right? And, and you know, my answer to that was and not to, to prosecute my dad, but to put it in, give him at least my perspective, is that if that were true, I have two sons that it would have been okay for me to do to them what he did to us. And, you know, I didn't do that. So, uh, you know, there was never, I, I loved my father. My one brother was, who was gone for so long, didn't get to spend that much time with him. And my older brother, uh, it was, uh, Marianne was really interesting. We would get together. I mean, it's not war. Yeah, right. We, we didn't go through a war together, but you do feel like you're, you survived something significant. And that's the way we kind of, we were together and talking about it. That's the way it sort of felt. But I, you know, in spite of everything, you know, if I want forgiveness, if I want unconditional love in my life, then I need to give that myself to the people around me. So I, I didn't hate my father. I loved my father and I took care of him. Well, and good for you and your brothers in um, addressing that, because that's really a kind of a personal journey. That's not something that I think a lot of people have discussion with, but to have the insight to look at it and go, okay, well, you know, these things happen and it is a generational thing to be able to break that and not perpetuate that to your family. I mean, that's such a huge thing. Well, that's uh, so, you know, we grew this company and I was a CEO and all this other uh, stuff that was all good and fine. But and I was blessed for those things to happen to me. But uh, the most significant accomplishment that I have in my life is uh, successfully raising two good human beings. Uh, one of them's uh, soon to be a cardiologist. Uh, he's at, uh, you know, he's an in internal medicine and he's well on his way to doing that. And my other son went to one of the best schools in the country, UNC Chapel Hill in their business school and works in artificial intelligence software. More importantly, you know, they're both good human beings and they treat people around in the right way. And, 
And to me, that it's I, I always look at that and the words that come to my mind when I think about where I started and, and my kids who I want them to be better than me and they seem to be well on their way is the idea of generational lift. And that's that's to me is the most significant accomplishment of my life. And uh, yeah, I'm proud of them. I mean, you know, all roads, everyone, we're all going to have our challenges, but they're doing well. And uh, I'm, I'm very happy about that. Spoken like a proud father. (laughs) (laughs) And you should be, I mean, those are some really great accomplishments being able to break that cycle and, and move forward. I I think a lot of times people don't know that there's a better way. And so they get stuck in that cycle. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? That's very true. And the idea of uh, role models helped me get out of that cycle. You know, I, I, I think you've read my book, but uh, one of the things that's actually saved me, and this is going to seem so backward, I'm sure to some of your listeners, particularly who aren't any from anywhere near the South, but when I was a little boy, uh, there was a TV show, The Andy Griffith Show, and I saw the relationship, the fictional, you know, backwood South relationship between a father and a son in that show when I was a little boy. And that made such an impression on me because it made me realize that the way things were going on in my house, you know, wasn't the way that it it was supposed to go, right? So I, because, you know, when you, you, you know, you can blame yourself for all that's happening. But when I saw that, I'm like, wow. So that's what it's like when, you know, there's discipline, sure, but there's communication and give and take. Uh, there's an apology given when needed. And uh, you know, that, and I, you know, I had a fourth grade teacher who, um, I'll never forget it. She told me, uh, it was my last good year academically until I got into college. Cause I was terrible. I went so far South the fifth through the 12th grade, uh, barely made it through high school. But she told me when I was in the fourth grade that she thought one day that I would do great things. I made straight A's in her class, by the way, which didn't happen again until college, <laughs> but, uh, you know, just having those those role models and seeing that there's a better way to behave, no matter where you get that from. Um, I mean, that helps, that helps to break that cycle and to see that larger world. And there's some other pointers that I give in my book. Um, but anyway, yeah, those things helped me see beyond uh, what was in front of me at home. Now that's definitely so important. And just the ability to overcome obstacles is what I was really touched by. How did you, I know you talked about faith, but how did you continue to find the perseverance to continue on your path? You know, Marianne, it's a, and some people, so my father was verbally abusive, so I can't deny there was an element of hearing his voice in my head telling me that I couldn't do it. Uh, And, and that making me angry and making, driving me, I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm a driven human being. I just, <laughs> I can't help that. And then maybe some of the voice in my head, along with my faith and other things, uh, helped me. I think uh, when I got married and I, you know, we started having children and I had a responsibility. Now, my father was, was a very responsible guy in terms of, you know, the broad contractual language around being responsible in terms of food on the table and roof over the head. But I once I had that responsibility for someone other than me, you know, you begin to live for something other than yourself, right? And, uh, you know, I wanted to take care of them and make sure they had a better life. So that motivated me. My father's words motivated me. My faith motivated me. And then, uh, you know, it's an iterative process when you're trying to grow beyond an element of abuse or neglect in your life, because you got to have the courage to try when you've been told that you can't do it. And that's a that's not an easy thing. You, you've got to have that courage to try. And chances are when you first begin to try and reach for things that really given your upbringing, you probably shouldn't be able to get, reach for successfully, um, you're going to fail early. Because, you know, in my case, I missed a good portion of education early in my life because I, I was apathetic and didn't care. I was just trying to survive at home. And yeah, you know, I had a lot of catching up to do. So once you hit the courage to try, then perseverance comes into place because chances are, because you may be behind because of the way you were raised and, and where you're now trying to start, uh, you're going to have to persevere. So there's going to be failure early. But when I mentioned the iterative process, 
It is the power of a few successes in your life and how that can carry you forward and how that can help you begin to shed the difficult times of the past because you're credibly showing yourself that, hey, wow, I can actually do this. And those successes, the more they happen, the more confident you become, you now begin to reacquire the self-esteem that you lost uh, when you didn't get it, when you didn't have it given to you when you were young. And uh, so I just encourage your listeners, if anyone's going through anything like that, you know, have that courage to persevere. And boy, when those successes come, and they will, I believe that firmly, uh, then it, it just, it's amazing how your perspective of what you're capable of can begin to change. And that's just a, that's a, that's a wonderful time in your life when that begins to happen. So I, I encourage any listener out there that has doubts about themselves to continue to reach uh, because it's a wonderful thing when you, you, you learn something about yourself and what you're capable of that you didn't know. For the parents out there that are listening to this interview and maybe questioning their parenting style, what do you have to say to them? You know, I, what I can t- say is this, I, you know, okay, so let's get into the question of, you know, a smack on the bottom, that type of thing. Look, it, if there's a real reason why that's done and it's not physically over the top and really hurting your children, you know, then everyone has their own school of thought about what they want to do. Do not hurt your children physically. That's where I began. My style of parenting, right or wrong, was this. And that is I, I, I could not touch my children. I, I just... I just could not do it for obvious reasons. But what I did do is I tried to uh, pick my spots on the important things. I tried to, you know, when they were out of line and they were, you know, it was clear and I felt it was a significant enough thing. Then I would weigh in and there would be a, a look on my, in, on my face. There would be words that I would speak that would let them know immediately that they needed to get back in line. But you can't do that all the time because then it falls on deaf ears. So you get to me, you have to be selective on the important things, and then you have to respond in such a way that they recognize very quickly uh, that they've done something wrong. And then there, and then the other things is, you know, with my kids, we were very cognizant, uh, and this is not uh, you know rocket science here, but who they spent their time with outside of our home. Uh, you know, when they were young, if they were going to have sleepovers, we called the parents. Uh, we involved our kids in sports and kept them busy, uh, but you know. To me, it's just they have you still have to establish the boundaries, but you know, your sense of prioritization in terms of when you discipline your kid and your children is it, to me is very important because it has to be meaningful to them when you when you react in a way uh, that tells them it's time to let's get this moving in a better direction. So that for me, I uh, couldn't touch my children, but uh, knock on wood, they seem to be doing pretty well so far. And they knew. Because they, when they became older in their 20s and stuff, they said, boy, I remember when dad used to get a look on his face. So, you know, they, they knew. Uh, but, um, you know, uh, hopefully some of that is helpful. Well, a lot can be said with a look, you know, especially if it's coming from <laughs> your father, I'm sure. <laughs> well, I think you choose your, I think your words are important too. What you say and how you say. Um, I know one of my sons, my youngest, he, which actually was a very proud moment for me, he told uh, his uncle, that uh, whenever I said something like, now, son, you can listen to me on this or not, he always stopped and immediately listened because he knew that I was going to tell him something important that he needed to hear. And it's really interesting. Sometimes before I reacted, I would really stop and think about the message that I was going to communicate because uh, it's very important. I do believe the example that you set is the most important thing with raising your children. But when you when you do use words, Use words that you've thought about and that you really think can cut through and make a difference. Well, David, I found your book, Relative Distance, to be such an impactful read. Where can our listeners connect with you and be part of your community and learn more about your work? Yeah, so I have a website, <clears throat> davidlpruitt.com, that will give you more information on the book. Uh, more information on the issue of abuse itself. But you can go to that website and there's also a link over to uh, Amazon or Barnes and Noble or wherever you want to buy your, uh, your book. And uh, again, I 
You know, to me, when I read a book, if I could really quickly, the two things that are most important to me in a good book is number one, uh, am I emotionally engaged when I read the book? Does it move me in some way? Uh, and then number two, am I learning something? And, uh, you know, I, Marianne, I think you've read the book. I don't think there's any question you'll be emotionally engaged. And I hope that some of the some of the thinking that I, because people don't read a memoir to learn about you, they read it to learn about themselves. And I hope there'll be enough good uh, insights and uh, commentary outside of the story itself that might be helpful to someone who could use it. So, uh, but davidlpruitt.com is my website and I certainly appreciate uh, any interest and consideration in the book. Well, David, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. Well, Marianne, it was my pleasure. Thank you for sharing your uh, platform with me. I, I truly appreciate it. Well, David, thank you so much. It's been such an honor to spend this time with you and to talk about your new memoir, Relative Distance. Relative Distance is available to Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all indie retailers. And again, support our indie bookstores. If you don't see it on the shelf there, just ask for them to order it. Make sure to connect with David at his website, davidlpruitt.com, to be part of his community, learn more about his work, and get involved in the advancement of your personal self-development. We're going to pause here for a quick moment, and we'll be right back after this message. I'd like to thank Jason Eastwood at Guitarfulness for sharing his inspiring music and talent with us. His music is known worldwide for cultivating atmospheres of harmony, inner peace, and clarity. Visit Jason's website at guitarfulness.com. Join his newsletter, be part of his community, and download his music. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne, where we make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work, and while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information.